This morning, I'll be sharing with you two messages. As you can see on the screen, the first message is the personhood of the Spirit. The personhood of the Spirit. And the second message will follow on. And the title of the second message is, Is the Holy Spirit received or formed? Received or formed. Now, why am I sharing these things? It's going to be a deep Bible study. It's not going to be a shallow thing. So I hope you'll... Uh, Put your seatbelt on and be ready for a Bible study. Amen? That's why we're here. You're not here to hear what I have to say. You're here to see what God has to say. Amen? Amen. Yes? We're in harmony? Now, uh, some of our people uh, are trying to steer away so far from the Trinity doctrine that I believe they are falling in another ditch. The Trinity believes or teaches you that there is God the Father, there is God the Son, and there is God the Holy Spirit. So when we study the Bible, we find out that that is not so. That's not how it is presented in the Scriptures. So we are steering away so far that, for example, when it comes to the Sonship of Christ, say some people believe that Jesus did not pre-exist prior to his birth in Bethlehem. They want to go so far from the Trinity, they're falling in a ditch. That is an error. Some say, oh, you can't say Jesus is God. Well, that is falling in a ditch. That is an error because the scripture calls him God, right? I have a book at the back, Biblical Monotheism. You can read it and study it. When it comes to the spirit, our people are doing a similar mistake. Some of our people, not all of them, are doing a similar mistake by saying, well, the Holy Spirit is not a person. The Holy Spirit is an influence and a power uh, th th that comes as you read the word, as you study the scriptures. Uh, uh, God will touch your heart and touch your mind and so forth. But it is minimizing the personhood of the Spirit. So all what I want to do this morning is look at what does the Bible have to say. Amen? Uh, so I want you to stay with me. That's how we are going to travel. In this presentation... We're going to address the questions, is the Holy Spirit a person with a personality or an influence or a power? Then we're going to examine the personality of the Spirit through the scriptures. And we're going to look at some statements from Ellen White because I know some of our uh, listeners and hearers come from an Adventist background. So I want to show what Ellen White has to say. But we establish, every, I establish everything from the scriptures. Yes? yes? All right. Now, for those, if uh, someone is watching us uh, online, welcome. God bless you. Okay. Let us begin with uh, what Jesus said in John chapter 14. I will have the words on the screen up there. Hopefully, you can read them. In John chapter 14, beginning at verse 26. And Jesus saying, he says, But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. So Jesus speaking about the comforter, about the spirit that is to come. How is Jesus presenting the spirit? I know I'm familiar with the passage. I know he's speaking in parables. I know all that. But I want us to understand what we are reading. How is Jesus presenting the Spirit? Is Jesus presenting the Spirit as a power, as an influence, or is Jesus presenting the Spirit as a person? Let us be honest with the Scriptures. How is Jesus presenting the Spirit? He shall teach you all things. He will bring things to your remembrance. Right? Well, it seems like it's a person. In 16 verse 12, I have yet many things to say unto you, but he, but he cannot bear them now. Howbeit, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. What is Jesus saying? Forget about my theology. Forget about your theology. Focus on his theology. What is Jesus saying? He's saying when this, when the comforter that I've promised to send unto you will come unto you, he will teach you. He will remind you. He will guide you. He will hear. And whatsoever he hears, he will say unto you. Am I adding anything to the words of Jesus or is this what Jesus said? 
Don't worry. I don't believe in the Trinity. I'm not teaching you the Trinity. I'm not. But I just want us to understand the scriptures. This is what Jesus is saying. Let us not change it. Let us not add to it. Let's not take from it. Let's understand it. You with me? So it seems that Jesus is presenting the Spirit as a person who will teach, who will guide, who will lead, who will remind you of things that the Spirit hears. He will hear things, and whatsoever he hears, he will say unto you. Okay, I'm aware that if you keep reading in the conversation Jesus speaking when he gets to John chapter 16, he says that I've spo these things I've spoken unto you in parables. That's taken. Jesus was speaking in parables. He wasn't speaking in the first person. He was speaking in parables. I understand. But how was he presenting the comforter, the spirit? As an influence, a power, or as a person? I think so far he's presenting the spirit as a person. But let us, I want us to keep going and see what else we read about Jesus. Now, notice what he said here. He said that the spirit, whatsoever he hears, he will speak. So this comforter that will come unto you, whatsoever he hears from God, he will say unto you. Notice what Jesus said about himself when he was here on earth. In John chapter 12, verse 49, he says, For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what, what I should speak. In chapter 8, verse 26, he says, I have many things to say and to judge of you, but he that sent me is true. And I speak to the world those things which I have heard of him. So when Jesus was talking about himself, he says, listen, the words, when he was here on earth, he says, as a person in flesh, that is, he's saying, the words that I speak unto you, they're not mine. Whatsoever I hear from my father, I will say to you. Is that what he said? Then in John 14, when he is talking about the comforter that is to come, he says, listen, the comforter that is coming, that will come, he will remind you, he will teach you whatsoever he hears, that he will say. Yes? Jesus was a person in flesh, and the comforter that he's talking about seems to be a person. I haven't touched on the identity of the comforter yet. Don't jump to conclusions. You with me? We're just reading and understanding. That's all what we're doing. Okay, now, I want us to jump from what Jesus said about the Comforter, about the Spirit, and I want us to get into the book of Acts. Because the book of Acts is, it describes to us how the disciples lived, what they did, what they heard, their experience, and that it describes when they received the Comforter and, and so forth. So I want us to examine the book of Acts. But before we get there, I want us to see one thing about the Spirit. We are told in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10 to 13. We'll begin reading there. It says, But God has revealed them unto us by His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of God, save the Spirit of God which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. There's a, a thought being portrayed here. Usually we quote this passage, especially verse 11, where it says, compares the relationship between God and His Spirit with the relationship between man and His Spirit, right? We've done that many times. That just like the Spirit of God knows the things of God, so the Spirit of man knows the things of man. But the author, all what he wants to get to us and tell us is that the Holy Spirit is teaching us. But to do that, he said, the Spirit searches the deep things of God, meaning the Spirit knows the thoughts of God. Then he says, he compared man and his Spirit with God and his Spirit. Then he says, we receive the Spirit of God, the same Spirit that knows the things of God, and then he says the Spirit teaches us. In other words, what he's saying, that the Spirit knows what God knows. Yes? Because when you receive the Spirit, you are receiving what God wants you to hear and to know. In this passage, I believe, Paul unlocked what Jesus said, uh, where, where he said that whatsoever the Spirit hears, he will say unto you. 
Why is that? Because the Spirit knows the thoughts of God, knows the minds of God. When you receive the Spirit, you receive what God wants you to receive. It will get clearer as we keep going. But then he goes on, verse 14 to, to 16. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. For who has known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Now notice he said we receive the Spirit of God. And as a conclusion of that, he said we have the mind of Christ. Why didn't he say we have the mind of the Spirit like he said in, in Romans 8? Because in his mind, as we will find out later on, the Spirit, the comfort that you receive, is none else than Jesus Christ. When you receive the Spirit... You have the mind of Christ. You have Jesus Christ. We will see that as it unfolds. But I just wanted to highlight that uh, first. Now, let us get to the uh, uh, examining how the Bible describe, describes the Spirit. Uh, the Spirit speaks to people. I'm just going to state them and give you some examples. In Acts chapter 8, verse 29, Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go ye near and join yourself. In chapter 10, Acts 10, verse 19, while Peter thought on the vision, the Spirit said unto him. In Acts 13, verse 2, the Holy Ghost said. Is this talking about an influence and a power, or is it describing a person who speaks? How did the, the apostles write it down? How did they record it? What is their experience? What do you, what do you think? He's describing a person who speaks. Right? Okay. Now, that speaks to people, but the Spirit also speaks through people. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 20, Jesus said, For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaketh in you. In Mark chapter 13, verse 11, he calls it the Holy Ghost. In Luke 21, he, he said, I will give you a mouth to speak. So the Holy Spirit will speak through you, not will speak to you, but will speak through you. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with what? With other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Who was speaking through them? The Spirit was speaking through them. In Acts 21 verse 4, And finding disciples, we tarried there seven days, who said to Paul through the Spirit that he should not go up to Jerusalem. Through the Spirit. So the Bible is presenting that the Spirit can teach, Spirit can guide, it, the Spirit speaks to people, the Spirit speaks through people. The Spirit instructs people, Acts 13 verse 4, So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Celestia and, and goes on. They were sent by the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost sends them. The Spirit makes decisions. In Acts chapter 15, verse 28, it says, For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and it seemed good to us. It seems that the apostles realized, understood that the Holy Spirit is a person and the Holy Spirit makes decisions. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and also to us. Just a side note, I wonder, did the apostles think that they could decide something different than the Holy Ghost. It seemed good to the Holy Ghost and also to us. So what, did, did you have another option? It didn't seem good to you? But anyway, the Spirit makes decisions. Spirit transports people in Acts chapter 8, verse 39. And when they were come up out of the water, that's Philip and the Ethiopian, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip. Listen, I'm just reading verses how the apostles wrote it down. If you were in their shoes, you would write down what you experienced, what you saw, and what you believed. Is that correct? They wrote what they experienced, what they thought, and what they believed. And the way they're writing it down is that the Spirit is a person. Right? The Spirit can be lied to. We know this example in Acts chapter 5, Ananias and Sapphira. Peter said, you lied to the Holy Ghost. Then in verse 4, he said, you lied unto God. In verse 9, he said, you lied unto the Spirit of the Lord. I'm, I'm not dealing with the identity of the Spirit. 
understand what it is, we will get to it soon. But I just want you to realize how the apostles are presenting it. They're presenting the Spirit as a person, can teach, can guide, can speak, can be spoken to, uh, or can speak through you, rather, sorry, can be lied to. Okay, the Spirit can forbid people. This is an interesting text. In, in Acts chapter 16, verse 6 and 7, it says, Now when they had gone through uh, Pergia and, and the region of Galatia, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, so the Holy Ghost forbade them, it goes on to say in verse 7, After they were come to Mes Mesia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. This is the King James Version. Right? So Luke is writing here. In verse 6, he says the Holy Ghost forbade them. In verse 7, he says the Spirit. Right? But notice the other translations, how it puts verse 7. The Revised Version where it says the Spirit, in verse 7 it says the Spirit suffered them not. The Revised Version said it's the Spirit of Jesus. The ISV says it's the Spirit of Jesus. The ESV says it's the Spirit of Jesus. The ASV says it's the Spirit of Jesus. The SDA Bible Commentary says this. The reading Spirit, text, commenting on this, textual evidence attests the reading Spirit of Jesus. This confirms the view that the Spirit stands in the same relation to the Son as to the Father and may therefore be spoken of as either the Spirit of God or the Spirit of Christ or of Jesus. It's interesting that when the apostles are writing, Luke is writing in their experience, they said the Holy Ghost forbade us and they said it's the Spirit of Jesus didn't let us know. So in their mind, who was the Holy Ghost? The Spirit of Jesus. We're going to see plenty more evidence, but this is just, just, a, just a hint that we get from the way they're writing things. But again, they're writing it in a way to seem that it is a person forbade them to do things. The Spirit gives spiritual gifts in 1 Corinthians 12, 11, but the one and the same Spirit worketh all these things, distributing separately to each one as he desires. So according to Paul in this passage, he's saying it's the Holy Ghost that gives gifts. So, so far, what are we seeing? Are we seeing the apostles presenting the Spirit as an influence and a power, or are they presenting the Spirit as a person? As a person. Are, are you following me with what the Scripture is saying? I don't want to read into the Scriptures. I just wanted to read the Scriptures to you. And the scriptures clearly present the spirit as a person that can be lied to, can be grieved, can direct, can speak to, can speak through you, can teach you, and, and so forth, all the other things that we read, right? It's a person. Don't miss a point. Now, I understand that some people take these verses that I shared and conclude, there you go, the Spirit is a person, Jesus is a person, God the Father is a person, that's the Trinity, brother, what are you going on about? Well, hang on a second. Let's not make a leap of faith in here, right? Let's just study the Scriptures. Yes, the Bible clearly, plainly presents to us the Spirit as a person. And I might add, with a personality. But the Bible also clearly tells us who the Spirit is. We're going to see that, right? But before we jump to the next section, segment, I just want to make sure you guys are on board with me. Does the Bible present the Spirit as a person, or does the Bible present the Spirit as an influence and a power? I'm only hearing three of you. What about the rest of you? Yes? Okay, because we're going to build on that. The rest of this message and next message, we're building on that. All right. Now, for, for those of you who come from an Adventist background, we establish it from the Bible, Right? Our foundation is the Bible. But for those of you who come from an Adventist background, would like to know what Ellen White has to say, here is a couple of statements from Ellen White. She says, We need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is as much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds. Is Ellen White in harmony with the Bible? Yes, she, yes, she is. She goes on to say, The Holy Spirit is a person, for he beareth witness with our spirits that we are the children of God. She also says, the Holy Spirit 
has a personality. Else he could not bear witness to our spirits and with our spirits that we are the children of God. He must also be a divine person. Else he could not search out the secrets which lie hidden in the mind of God. I'm aware that Trinitarians use these statements to teach their theology. Just because they use them, it doesn't mean we throw them away. We don't. I believe these statements are in harmony with the Bible, that the Holy Spirit is a person that has a personality. So don't turn the Spirit into just a mere influence and a power that as you read the Word of God and as you get faith and so, don't do that. The Bible presents the Spirit as a person, right? Okay. Now, either this Spirit, this person is the person of Jesus or the Spirit is another person called God the Holy Spirit, hence we have the Trinity. What does the Bible have to say? Forget about my thoughts. What does the Bible have to say? I, I want to make this line, trace this line. I want you to follow it with me. In John chapter 1, verse 1, we read, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, right? Who is the Word? It's the one, the being who we have come to call Jesus, right? Right? But the Bible says this word was with God and he was God, meaning divine, whatever. This is not the topic. Whatever you want to put there, put whatever you want. I'm focusing on the word. Was that word a person? Back then, before he took upon himself flesh, back then, that word that was with God and was God, was he a person? Yes, yes he was a person. We believe in the pre-existence of Jesus, amen? amen? He was a person. Do we understand the nature of that person back then? Yes. No. That the nature, as in the nature of God, do we fully understand the nature of God? No. We understand flesh and blood and bone, but we don't understand the nature of God, right? But he was a person. Yes? Now we keep reading, get to verse 14, we see, And the word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So that word that was with God and was God, was divine, that person took upon himself flesh to dwell amongst us, right? Yes? Simple, basic, right? Is he still as much a person as he was a person before when he was with God? Yes, yes right? It's logical. It makes sense. Okay. Now, notice what the Bible says, what happened after Jesus rose from the dead. 1 Corinthians 15, 45, it says, And so it is written, The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam, who's the last Adam? Jesus. Jesus Christ. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit or a life-giving spirit. Yes? Why was he made a life-giving spirit? In Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Focus with me. I'm going to put it in a diagram soon so you can see it. We have the Word, was a person. The Word took upon himself flesh. He's still as much a person. Then that Word that was flesh was made a life-giving spirit. When he was flesh, he dwelt amongst us. When he was made spirit, he dwells in us. That's what the Bible says, right? Isn't that what Jesus said in John 14 when he was talking about the other comforter? Notice what he says. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but you know him, for he dwelleth where? In you. With you, and shall be in you. So that comfort, Jesus said, listen, that comforter I'm talking to you about, he's dwelling with you, and shall be in you. Yes? And then he says, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. Now, here is the diagram. That first circle has word in it. That word is the Son of God, the Word of God. Had the divine nature, was made flesh to dwell among us. It's still the same word. Then he was made spirit to dwell in us, but he's still the same word. Yet he maintained a body, a body in heaven. I'm not denying that, right? But all along, it's still the same word. When he was divine, like before he came to earth, rather, then when he took upon himself flesh, 
Then when he was made spirit, he's still the same word. Right? Yes? Are we in agreement? Is he any less person now because he is in a nature that we don't understand? When he was, before he came to earth, he was in a nature that we don't understand, but we know he was a person. Then after his resurrection, he was made spirit. He's in a nature that we don't understand, but is he still a person? He is still as much a person as God is a person. Did we hear that before? The spirit is as much a person as God is a person? Why? Because it's the same person, the same word that was with God, that was God, took upon himself flesh to dwell amongst us, and then he was made spirit to dwell in us. That's a story that's illustrated in the sanctuary. Make me a tabernacle that I might dwell among you in the Old Testament, then in the New Testament, let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among you in Exodus. Then in the New Testament, Paul tells us, Know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwell in you? That same being who came and dwelt amongst us, tabernacled amongst us, is the same being that dwells in us. He's as much a person as when he was in flesh and blood. He's a person. Are you catching my drift? Are you following me? Did I, am I leaving any of you behind? Am I going a bit too fast? No? I'm trying to emphasize to you from the scriptures so you can see it very plainly for yourself that the Holy Spirit is a person with a personality. It's not just a part. It's not just an influence. Don't do that because that's wrong. That's error. The Holy Spirit is a person with a personality. But what we're seeing so far is that the Holy Spirit is a person of Jesus Christ. We're going to see much more evidence. But I, I'm, I want you to see it very clearly that it's a person. All right. Let's see what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 6, he says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we of him, and one Lord. Who is he? Jesus Christ. By whom are all things, and we by him. How many lords? Who is he? Jesus Christ, he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, now the Lord, who is the Lord? Jesus. Jesus. He's writing to the same people, his second letter. He says there's one Lord is Jesus. Then he tells them now the Lord or Jesus is that spirit. And he says to the same people in the first letter that the last Adam or Jesus was made a life-giving spirit. So Paul clearly says, listen, we only have one Lord, it is Jesus. He says, this Lord or Jesus was made a life-giving spirit. And then he tells you this Lord or Jesus is the Holy Spirit. I mean, how much more clearer do you want that? Right? It's very clear. Jesus also said, Lord, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, Luke wrote the Gospel of Luke, and then he wrote the Acts of the Apostles, which can be titled as the acts of who Luke. yeah yeah but you know many people give it the acts of the holy spirit right because the whole throughout the whole book he's showing how the holy spirit was working in them the holy spirit was working through them the holy spirit was speaking to them and through them and taking people to God. right now mark writes only the gospel he doesn't write the book of acts but notice in one verse he sums up the book of acts how he says it in Chapter 16, verse 19 and 20. So then after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. And they went forth, the disciples, the apostles, they went forth and preached everywhere the Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Amen. So Mark sums up the book of Acts or the book of the Holy Ghost, the Acts of the Holy Ghost. He sums it up in one verse saying it's the Lord Jesus working with them. Yes? Can you see that? All right. Now, I, I want to give a bit more evidence. So I don't leave anybody thinking I believe in the Trinity or I'm teaching Trinity or that the Holy Spirit is God, the Holy Spirit. I, I'm going to give you a bit more evidence to show you that the Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ himself in spirit form. 
If we compare in, in John chapter 14, because I know this is one, one of the objections, in John chapter 14, when Jesus said, I'll send you another comforter, I'm going to compare it here. On one side, write what Jesus said about himself. On the other side, write what Jesus said about the comforter. I want you to see what happens. He says, the world will see me no more. Talking about himself, he says, the world seeth him not. So, sorry, talking about the comforter. Talking about himself, he says, but you see me. Talking about the comforter, he says, but you know him. Talking about, uh, or rather, Jesus was with them at that time. Talking about the comforter, he said, he dwelleth with you. Jesus said there, I in you. Talking about the comforter, he says, he shall be in you. He says, I will come to you. Talking about the comforter, he says, I will give you another comforter. In Matthew, Jesus said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. There in that passage, John 14, he says, He may abide with you forever. As you can see, if you parallel what Jesus said about himself in John 14 and what he said about the Spirit, he was speaking about himself in the third person. Right? As you can see. Notice what else we read in John 14, 26. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance, whatsoever I've taught you. So what will the Father send in my name? The Holy Ghost. Okay, so what's the fulfillment of that? What did the Father send? In Galatians 4, 6, And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Right? This is the fulfillment of what Jesus promised. So the Holy Ghost is the spirit of his son. Is the spirit of Jesus a different person than Jesus? No, it's the same person. All right. I just want to fast forward a bit. Again, Paul, comparing Paul with Paul, he says, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19, and in, 1 Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, he says, Know ye not your own selves how that Jesus Christ is in you? So he says, The Holy Spirit is in you. Then he says, It's Jesus Christ who is in you. Listen, the only way for us to please God, the only way for us to receive what God has for us is to receive Jesus Christ himself inside of us. This is our hope of glory. You don't have any other hope of glory except Christ in you. Here is a few verses for you to see for yourself. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Romans 8.10, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Colossians 1.27, Christ in you, the hope of glory. 1 John 4.4, 4, greater is he that is in you. He's talking about Jesus. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Know you not yourselves how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be a reprobate? Revelation 3, 20. Behold, I, Jesus, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, sup with him and he with me. And Galatians 2, 20. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We receive eternal life because we receive the life of Jesus Christ, because we receive Jesus Christ himself inside of us. You with me? I wanted to establish it very clearly, very plainly from the Word of God, that the Holy Spirit is not a mere influence. The Holy Spirit is not a mere power. It's not uh, uh, just some thoughts you get or, or character you develop or something of that sort. The Holy Spirit is a person with a personality. It is the very person of Jesus Christ himself. He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He meant what he said. He said what he meant. We better believe it. All right, a couple more slides and we will stop. In 2 Corinthians 4, verse 10 and 11 always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh whose life it's the life of Jesus in our mortal flesh when you receive the Holy Spirit who are you receiving 
You're receiving Jesus Christ. That's what he said. Dwell with you, and I will be in you. That's what he said. Now, notice what Ellen White has to say as well. Again, did we prove it from the Bible? Is the Bible clear that when you receive the Holy Spirit, you're receiving Jesus Christ? Is it clear? So our authority is the Bible. But for those who like to hear what Ellen White has to say, I'm going to put a few statements for you to, say, to see it for yourself. She says, we want the Holy Spirit, which is Jesus Christ. That's nothing new. That's what Paul said. The Lord, or Jesus, is that Spirit. She's saying the same thing. The Holy Spirit is Jesus Christ. That's what Paul said. Then she says, Comfort with humanity, Christ could not be in every place personally. Therefore, it was altogether for their advantage that, she, that he should leave them, go to his Father, and send the Holy Spirit to be his successor on earth. The Holy Spirit is himself. It's Christ himself. Divested of the personality of humanity and independent thereof. What does that mean? Say again. He didn't have his human body. The Holy Spirit is Christ himself without his human flesh. Isn't that what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 45? The last Adam or Jesus was made a life-giving spirit. And Jesus said a spirit does not have flesh and bone. So it's without their flesh. Go on to say in another place, rather, she says, the work of the ministry is no common work. Christ is withdrawn only from the eye of sense. But he is as truly present by his spirit as when he was visible, visibly present on earth. The time that has lapsed since his ascension has brought no interruption in the fulfillment of his parting promise. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Again, she's repeating what we find in the Bible. That he's only withdrawn from the eye of sense, but he is as much with us today as he was with the apostles. Why? Remember that diagram that I told you? The same word was in the divine nature. We don't understand it. Then that same word was made flesh. We understand that. Then that word was made spirit. We don't understand that nature, but it's the same person. He came to dwell amongst us. And after his resurrection and glorification, we'll look at that in the next session. He comes to dwell in us. You with me? Okay. Think one or two more statements. I will pray the Father, and he shall send you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But you know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Commenting on these verses, she says, This refers to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ, called the Comforter. Do, do we understand what the word omnipresence means? What does it mean? can be present everywhere at once. It doesn't mean he is present everywhere at once. He's in the tree, he's in the wall, he's in the curtain. No, 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 no. It means he can, he has the ability to be everywhere, wherever he wants at once. So when Jesus said, I'll pray the Father and send you another comforter, Ellen White commenting on it, she says he's referring to the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ. Now, when you're looking at the omnipresence of the Spirit of Christ, just admit that we don't understand it. We just don't. Don't try to explain it and limit it, and this is the avenue, how God could be everywhere, and he needs to use this or he needs to use that. Just leave it alone. Don't get in the nitty-gritty of it. We don't understand it. Leave it alone. All right. Another one. When on the day of Pentecost, the promised comforter descended, and the power from on high was given, and the souls of the believers thrilled with the conscience presence of their ascended Lord, then even though like his, their pathway led through sacrifice and, and goes on to say, but when the Spirit came on Pentecost, who did they recognize? It's the conscience presence of their ascended Lord. Who's their ascended Lord? God the Holy Spirit? No, their ascended Lord is Jesus Christ. So when they received the Holy Spirit, they recognized the very presence, the conscience presence of their ascended Lord. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the very person of Jesus Christ. It's not just an influence. It's not just a power. It is a person. It's a full-on person with a personality. It is Jesus Christ himself without a physical form. Do I understand how he can do that? No. Will I attempt to explain it? No. 
It's something beyond our comprehension as human beings. Let's just leave it at that. Amen. Okay. So yes, the Holy Spirit is as much a person as God is a person. Yes, He's divine and has the God nature. Why? Because it is the very person of Jesus Christ. Do I have another one? No. It is the very nature of, it is the very person of Jesus Christ. This explains why the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. We will look at that in the next session. It explains why Peter would say, by lying to the Holy Spirit, you have lied to God. It explains why the apostles would say the Spirit forbade us, then say the Spirit of Jesus forbade us, as we saw. It explains why Luke would record the book of the Acts of the Holy Spirit, yet Mark says the Lord was with them. It harmonizes, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I am with you always. It harmonizes that with, I will send you another comforter. It all blends in beautifully. Why? Because this comforter is the very person of Jesus Christ in another form. Amen? Now, there's many aspects to it. I understand. I didn't touch on everything. If somebody will ask, well, hang on a second. Which spirit did lead Jesus to the wilderness? Is that Jesus leading himself? No, it's not. That was the spirit of a father. There's much more to it than, than what I could cover in this session. But briefly, it is the spirit of the father coming in Christ and then coming from Christ to us as we receive Christ we receive the Father also because God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself if you want to learn more I have books and DVDs on the back table you can get uh, more information that way but I just wanted to highlight very plainly and very clearly is the spirit a person with a personality or is the spirit a power and an influence which one is it a person with a personality. We saw that from Scripture. We saw it from the writings of Ellen White. Is the Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, a different person than Jesus Christ? Or is the Spirit the very person of Jesus Christ? What did we see? It's the very person of Jesus Christ. It's not my words. I just read them to you. Right? Okay. So this will conclude our first segment. In the next section, I will look more at is it formed or is it received? I will explain why we will look at that. But for now, let us close with a prayer. Father in heaven, <clears throat> Father, we thank you with all our hearts for your love. Thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your word that is truth. We thank you, Father, for your spirit that guides and leads us, that speaks to our hearts and our minds. We thank you, Father, for making us a temple in which you want to dwell and your son through your spirit. Father, I pray for your people, whether here or watching. Lord, as, they, uh, as we have shared, touched on this topic that can be a bit uh, meaty for some, I pray, Lord, that your spirit will take the words I said, will unlock them, will explain them to your people, Lord, and will turn them into words of life. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.